Obviously, the video is about the keyboard, but I think I'm going to orient it in a different way. Starting off with the most interesting bits, and if I can convince you through this hellish adventure, oh, ho, 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 do I have some information for you at the end. Would I recommend hand wiring your keyboard from scratch? No, just, just don't do it. If you really want to build a keyboard, at the very least, buy a PCB. It will quite literally save you weeks of soldering and wiring. With that being said, if you are an electrical enthusiast, I do recommend that you make a keyboard as to how is by your discretion because this simple thing that we use every day is quite complex to put together and it's a lot cooler than just the click and clacks that we love to hear and feel before we start this build a disclaimer this is the first keyboard i've built and there are a plethora of other keyboard builds out there i just wanted to make an upcycled 3d printed 100 percent backlitted hand-wired keyboard and if you think that's interesting then stick around you weirdo because i didn't use lube and I'm okay with it. I just know that the keyboard community is gonna castrate me for that. Okay, let's go. So I'm 3D printing my own case and sourcing my key switches and keycaps used. But don't fret, I'll have links in the description pointing as to what I would have gotten. So you could spend even more money building a keyboard for what you would have paid for if you just bought it stock. Anyway, let's pop the screws. Realize that you should have been printing the case that you downloaded from Robot Canada on Thingiverse to save time. Go back to disassembling the donor board. Use a giant solder blob to remove the LEDs. Pop the switch out. Check up on your... Looks normal to me. Weld your plastic together. Pop the switches in. Find out that the cherry stabilizers from the donors don't fit. Buy CoStar stabilizers from your favorite website. Realize that the infill and orientation of the printed case makes it impossible to fit together, so you need to reprint. Design your keyboard on Keyboard Layout Editor. Port it to Keyboard Firmware Builder. Pick your microcontroller accordingly. I am using the TNC 2.0++. Establish your pin. For some reason, my D6 pin wouldn't work. E2 and E3 seems to be divided by zero by the universe. Save the JSON and the hex file. Flip the diagram, use your copper wire for the columns because you have a lot of it laying around. Use some electrical tape to isolate those wires. And for the rows, realize that you forgot to buy the diodes. So of course you go to eBay and then you wait. Waiting, waiting, wait, wait, wait. And they're here. Wire the diodes with the black strip facing away from the switch. If you prefer the other way, Fine, just be consistent and change the flow of current because you want to be quirky and different. Plug in all of the LEDs and solder all the anodes together. Solder two kilo ohm resistors to each of the cathodes and solder the resistors together. Then wire the columns and rows to their respective IOs defined on Kentucky Fried Beef. Download the TNC loader, find and flash the hex file onto the MC. Mm. Only one way to fix it. Though we have the LEDs wired in parallel and we have current limiting resistors, the TNC pins can't deliver anything more than 10 milliamps. And when you have 5 volts across 2 kilo ohms times 104, so we're gonna use the 5 volts straight from the USB. All the TNC has to do is say, hey, you can go now. To do that, we'll be using an N channel logic level MOSFET which is really any MOSFET with a small gate threshold voltage. And yes, component salvaging is the main cause for GPU shortages. A pulse width modulation pin is connected to the gate of the MOSFET and when voltage is high, it allows current to go from the 5 volt line to pass through the anodes of the LEDs out the cathode, through the resistor, into the drain of the MOSFET and out the source where it meets with ground. Then there's this 10K resistor chilling between the gate and source. Why 10 kilo ohms and why is it there in the first place? Look, this is a video about keyboards, not MOSFETs. This stuff over here is something that I did for the lock keys. Use some more electrical. Well, I guess I don't really need to use any tape. Just kidding, I'm gonna use some capped on tape here. Punch it all together, move to a different table, click in the stabilizers, and finally, the keycaps.
That was my personal journey through purgatory, and despite my constant anguish and stress, I had a lot of fun. I haven't talked about it yet, but if you want to expand the functionalities and make your custom keyboard more custom, and if you just want to learn more in general, you should try using QMK firmware from the source level. But man, anyone who knows or can figure out how to use that firmware, don't even try and play it off as easy. You guys are just like wizards. It's like learning a new language. There's enough documentation there to teach a whole semester. Though, if all you want is just a simple custom keyboard with backlighting, KFB is good enough. Anywho, that's my video. Watch the extras if you want. I'ma thank Lee Andrew Jones for producing the track news in the background of this video. Also, a shout out once again to Robot Canada for designing this deck. I'm not gonna lie, it was kind of a pain to put together, but the design is pretty simplistic and nice. Oh, and also the Discord users, because they are the best tools to just learning something new. Now I guess it's time for a corny joke. Uh, oh, making one of these can be the key to curing your board. Dumb. Stay lit, guys. It's confusing. It is a process to download and you do have to deal with the source code. I found this video pretty useful. All you really have to do is download QMK MSYS and a text editor. I use Visual Studio Code. QMK MSYS is actually quite nice because it's somewhat self-explanatory. Run the red stuff to download QMK and then the Salsa Verde stuff to compile the firmware. QMK comes with a lot of pre-made keyboards so it's probably just a good idea to find one that fits your design. Take the source code from KFB and then copy and paste the config keyboard and key map files. Well, at least just the important bits. If you want a certain function that KFB does not provide, look through the documentation and if it still doesn't work, make sure that whatever you want enabled is enabled in rules.mk. And then just compile the firmware in QMK MSYS and then Flash the Teensy with either Teensy Loader or QMK Toolbox. Now, there are two ways of wiring up a keyboard. The first is to directly wire it from, you know, the switch all the way to the corresponding pin on the microcontroller. So when I press the switch down, a current is going to go through from B7 all the way down to ground, leading you to, I don't know, the letter 5 or something. This is great until you realize that most keyboards are 40 to 100 different keys, which greatly outnumbers the amount of pins on most microcontrollers out there. Alternatively, you can set it up as a matrix. This web of rows and columns works by assigning a specific key to a coordinate. For example, the number H can be R1, C2. So when I press R1, C2, the number H should show up. Or the letter 7 can be like, I don't know, R2, C3, this spot right here. Then onto the microcontroller, all you really have to do is assign each row and each column onto a pin. Now, how is that advantageous? Well, right here, I only have five total rows and columns, whereas it controls a number of six different keys. <laughs> Big whoop, you gain an extra key. In this case, yeah, sure, just wiring it directly might be a little easier. In my case, the keyboard I'm making is 104 keys. How many rows and columns do I have all together? Only about 28, all of which can fit onto this Teensy 2.0 plus plus with room to spare. Sounds great, right? Too good to be true. That's because it is too good to be true. This matrix method has a flaw called ghosting. And no, it's not that ghosting, but it's similarly depressing. In this case, ghosting refers to when you have multiple key presses and some random uh, number or letter comes up without even pressing the key. As to why it happens, I believe it's beyond the scope of this video, so if you're still interested, just go to the link at the bottom below. They explain it pretty well there. Just know that this is where those diodes comes in to prevent Casper from sending us secret messages. The world ended in the year 2000. What? What do you mean the question was why two kilo ohms? Fine, fine. We're using a whole bunch of two kilo ohm resistors because not only do we have to 
consider the uh, max current draw of the Teensy, but also the maximum output of the USB 2.0, which is around 500 milliamps. And with a little bit of ohms law, 5 divided by 2000 ohms gives us 2.5 milliamps. Multiply that by 104 LEDs and you get 260 milliamps, which is definitely under the limit of the USB port and leaves us plenty of current for the TNT to use. You can probably get away with 1.8 kilo ohms, but it's to your discretion as to how high of a current you are willing to go with. Oh boy, the extra lighting stuff, which is the longest bit. I wanted to have the lock LEDs to turn on whenever either a caps, nums, or the scroll lock were on. But I also wanted them to turn on at the same time with all the other LEDs. So I designed this circuit. The design is very human. And look, it has a lot of diodes too. You can use the same diodes as you did for uh, your switches. I just used Jotsky diodes because... Yeah. The way this works is when a certain key, for example, the nums lock is activated. And then pin F3 is high with 5 volts and then electricity flows this way through the nums lock into the 2 kilo ohm resistor and down to ground, completing the circuit. Now when the keyboard backlight is on B5, which is the same right here for the other backlight stuff, well then go high electricity will run through these diodes, go up through all three of these locks and then through those resistors, down to ground completing the circuit. The diodes are there of course just to prevent shorts and now imagine what would happen if this diode wasn't here. Let's just blah, 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 blah. That means whenever B5 is high, then it's a lot easier for it to just go straight up and say hello to F3 whenever it's down, rather than spending 2K into the ground. At least that's what I think. I haven't actually tried it. Precautions aside, these are much more important down here. This time, imagine this dial disappearing. And now let's say F3 is high. That means the flow of current can now go all the way straight down here and hey look at that two free paths into the other lock keys so whenever f3 is on all the other leds are on even though just the nums lock is active just keep in mind that by doing this you're sending 2.5 milliamps through each of those leds and resistors when using b5 multiply that by three and add on 0.5 milliamps because of the 10k resistor you're now looking at 8 milliamps which is kind of close to the 10 milliamp limit of most microcontroller pins What are you still doing here? Video's over. I don't know anything else. If you need something, go through the comments, go into the description, through the documentation, or join the Discord server. Weirdos. For those who didn't get it, it's just an egg roll. I think grandma made it. So good.